everyone, my name is Sean and welcome to my advanced deck building guide for Yu-Gi-Oh! This is, uh, the aim of this video is to give players a framework for themselves to use when building decks and wanting to get better evaluations from their decks when playing the game. Uh, this is something which I teach to tons of players in real life and I'm going to be doing this via Legacy of the Duelist tier today but that doesn't mean it only applies to Legacy of the Duelist. This works no matter where you play the game or how you play it. So, uh, the purpose of this uh, video, like I said, is to give you a framework, and my framework has six steps to it. We have starters, extenders, removal cards, defensive cards, finishers, and engine requirements. I'm going to explain what these cards are in steps, but the point of this is to inform you of what playstyle your deck is going to overall uh, kind of end up being, and we'll get into that a little bit more at detail a little bit later on. So whenever you start to build a brand new deck, you want to look at what starters your deck has. And these are cards which are easy to use and almost readily available as soon as you draw them. Starter cards have very, very low activation requirements and the purpose of a star is that they move cards from your deck to a desirable location. Whether that be on the field, in the graveyard, in your hand, or maybe even in the banished pile. I've tried to use uh, cards on the Forbidden Limited list here uh, because hopefully these cards are generic enough that people can understand what they do. But to give you some examples of starters, we have Lone Fire Blossom, Tall Guy from the Underworld, and Last Will, which summon cards from the deck to the field. Lady Debug, Trickstar Candina, Terraforming and Reinforcement the Army, add you a card from your deck to your hand. Armageddon Knight, Dark Greffa, Foolish Burial, uh, uh, send a card from your deck to the graveyard. And things like Gold Sarcophagus banish a card, and it's a future summons you a card from your um, um, extra deck to the field. Cards which search out cards make better starters than cards which just draw you ra um, into a card randomly. But draw cards can still be powerful starters as well, such as Chicken Game, Graceful Charity, Pot of Greed, and Card of Demise. Um, these are cards which get you into more resources and hopefully even better starters as well. So they complement and work with stars altogether. Now the question is, when you're deck building, how many starters do you really want to have in your deck? Well, I'm going to tell you now, the magic number is 14. If you have 14 starters in your deck, you have a 90% chance of opening up your hand with at least one of them or more in your opening hand of 5 cards. And that is a really, really good number to have uh, reliably. That means in 1 in 10 games, you may not open with a starter, which honestly doesn't matter. Honestly, 90% uh, is a very, very good number to go with. That being said, can you play a deck that can't uh, get that many starters? Well, the answer is yes, and many decks do. And where you want to uh, cover this is by then going into your extenders. Before we go look at what extenders are and describing them, describing them I want to show you examples of poor quality starters. Marauding Captain, it summons you a monster from your hand to the field, doesn't get you a resource from your deck, and therefore is not a good quality starter, is more of an extender. Baker the Spy does get you a card from your deck to the field, but because she's a flip effect, she's quite slow, and therefore is a poor quality starter, and is better used as an extender. Monster Reborn is a very easy card to use, and one of the best extenders in the game, but you've got to have a desirable target before you can actually use it, and so, so therefore works as a starter, as an extender, and not a starter. I also want to point out that Reckless Greed also is a poor quality starter and that there are no other trap cards on this list at all because trap cards inherently are slow and don't make good quality starters. Uh, they're better at being defensive or removal cards or extenders. Finally, before we move off of starters, I want to just quickly talk to you about normal summons. Ideally, when you're building your deck, you don't want to have five, more than five dedicated normal summons. And the reason why is because no matter how many cards in your deck or how many starters you have, you still only get access to one normal summon per, uh, per turn due to game mechanics. So ideally when you're building your deck, you don't ever want to have more than five normal summons in your deck. Otherwise, if you draw too many of them, you'll be able to use one and not the other cards and the others will just have to sit there as bricks unless they can perform some other kind of role or job. So extenders, let's talk about those now. Extenders work like starters in that they move a card from one location to another, ideally to help you set up better and stronger plays. However, they have a higher activation cost and can't always necessarily be used immediately from the hand. For example, Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon can summon you a dragon from your graveyard or your hand, but you have to banish a dragon from your field in order to summon it. Uh, Monster Reborn we already talked about. Pot of Avarice 
draws you more cards from your deck to the hand, but you've got to shuffle in five cards from your deck graveyard first before you can use it. Trap cards can also work to be extenders as well, like Call of the Haunted or Metaverse. And uh, also cards in your extra deck can work as extenders. For a good example is Elder Entity Norden, which works like a Monster Reborn effect. When, that, when this card is summoned, you can summon a level 4 lower monster from your graveyard to the field. So the starter for this would be Instant Fusion. You pay a thousand life points, summon out Elder Entity Norden, and the Norden summons you back a monster from your graveyard. And uh, that is a, a very, very clear example of what a starter and extender is, in my opinion. Things like Laval Val Chain, Healthy Metal First, Electromite, and Summon Sorcerers all move cards from your decks to somewhere else, but because of their high summon cost or their activation requirements, um, they are considered to be extenders, not starters. Now, um, uh, evaluating the quality of your starters is very, very important, and you really, really want to stick with high quality extenders and starters as opposed to low quality ones. Some very, very easy examples of low quality extenders are fusion uh, cards and ritual based cards. Ritual based cards and fusion cards are very slow because they have very, very high activation requirements to use them. For example, polymerization. In order to fusion summon a monster through normal game mechanics, you need poly plus the monsters required to fusion summon in order to summon out your other monster, which can be very slow and requires a good amount of time to set up to use. Similarly, with ritual cards, you need the ritual cards, uh, ritual summon card, as well as the materials to summon out the ritual monster. And uh, again, that could be a very, very poor quality extender. Uh, some mistake that I see people playing as well, especially ones who are new to the game, is they love to build a blue eyes deck and they like to play cards like Kyber Man and White Son of Ancients. Kyber Man is an example of a poor quality extender because it summons a monster from your hand which you already have access to. Whereas White Son of Ancient is an example of a high quality extender because she summons you or it summons you a blue eyes white dragon from your deck uh, without any other, as, long, as soon as you send this card to the graveyard during the end phase. And therefore, this card works a lot better than Kyber Man overall. Now, uh, the question is, how many extenders do you want to have in your deck? Like I said, 14 is a sweet number for a number of starters. But in terms of number of extenders, that really is up to you. And I'm not going to give you a specific number uh, to follow by. What I will say to you as a rule is the number of starters and extenders you have in total will determine what type of playstyle deck you are building. So... If you have a total number of starters and extenders that add up to or equal to less than 15 in total, you are ideally going to be building a control style deck, and that will become more apparent a little bit later on. If you have a lot of starters and extenders, so somewhere I say above about 30 or 75% of your deck, you are then going to be building more of a combo deck. Somewhere in between the 15 and 30 mark, like around 20-25, uh, if your uh, number of starters and extenders kind of lie between there and there, you're going to be looking at building more hybrid deck. I'm going to show you examples of these a little bit later on and explain as to why your deck qualifies or fits into these roles a little bit more. But first, let's go on to the next two steps, removal cards and defensive cards. Removal cards are, as they say, cards which you use to remove your opponent's defense or resources. So examples of these are Change of Heart, Harpy's Feather Duster, Raigeki, Mind Control, Trap Dust Shoot, Delinquent Duo, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also use cards in your extra deck as removal cards like Castell, Diamond Dire Wolf, Tornado Dragon, uh, Trispania, Topologic Bomber, Zero Boros, and again so on and so forth. Uh, removal cards are necessary to play a game, and depending on what, how many starters and extenders you have, you either want to dedicate space in your main deck to it, or rely on your extra deck to do that for you. Um, before we move on from removal cards, I just want to say that players, if you, no matter what type of uh, form of Yu-Gi-Oh you're playing, definitely always keep these cards in mind. They're very generic style forms of removal, and they fit into a lot of decks right now for the game that we play. Dino Wrestler Pankletops, very, very generic. Uh, Nightmare Phoenix, Nightmare Unicorn, Cosmic Cyclone, Lightning Storm. If you're playing in real life, Lightning Storm is very expensive, so don't worry about getting this too much if you can't afford it. Mind Control, Super Poly. Twin Twisters and Evenly Match. All very, very powerful forms of generic removal. Definitely want to have access to these cards in one way, shape, or form. Defensive cards. Defensive cards are the opposite of removal cards in that they try to protect your board or put the opponent into a game state where they can't use their resources and you can, or you just stop them from playing. The most powerful type of defensive cards are Floodgates. 
And if your deck can run floodgates and your opponent's deck can't deal with it, it can often be an auto win battle for you for the game. For example, if you can play Dimension Fisher in your deck, and all monsters are sent to the graveyard banished instead of being sent to the graveyard, and your opponent has a graveyard based strategy, this card can be really really hard for them to deal with and they're going to need a certain type of removal card to get it off the field so that they can then continue to access their starters and extenders. So you want to have um, want to have almost all access to these uh, floodgate cards if you are trying to build a deck and if your deck can run them give it a shot it could be really powerful and useful for your deck. So we have things like deck ability 1, summon limit, skill drain, uh, imperial order, Goals and match, Mystic Mind. There are others as well. The uh, not to these are just to show some examples of a few. Another very common form of defensive cards are hand traps. Hand traps are very very popular right now, and if you're not using hand traps, you should be considering why are you not using hand traps in your deck or not, because they can be used on the first turn from your hand as activated resources. Things like DD Crow, Event Failure, Maxi, Ash Blossom, Ghost Ogre. And Nibiru are very uh, good examples of very very good hand traps that you can use. Um, so really, I think this should illustrate kind of what defensive cards are and what they do. If you kind of know what these cards are, extra deck can also have defensive cards like Appaloosa, Trap Trip, Rafael, Rafael, uh, Baguska, and Abyssweller are also examples of defensive cards that you can use from your extra deck as well. So. Uh, moving on from removal and defensive cards, um, we're now going to look at finishers. And the way I describe finishers to players is that uh, you want to have a card or you want to have access to a resource in your deck which can say, listen, I'm ready to win the game now, I'm going to win the game now. And it can often provide you with a comeback factor or just a way to seal the deal and win the game uh, when your game state is in the right situation. Uh, finishers are very very powerful and as you can see quite a few of them are on this list are actually banned so uh, yeah you have to respect that uh, you have to respect finishers and if you are not going to use them do be afraid if your opponent is going to be using them because they can steal games from you quite easily for example Yata Garasu stops your opponent from drawing cards return from a different dimension summons you as many cards as you can from your banished pile to the field to kind of OTK your opponent the last turn FTK used to be a disgusting play where literally would say we're going to end the game now and I'm going to win. But it also doesn't have to be about just winning the game. It could be providing you with some kind of re um, additional resources so you can either come back after your opponent, uh, after your opponent, or really get so far ahead that your opponent can't catch up to you. For example, Pot of Greed gives you two cards which can really set you up quite nicely uh, if you can use this again and again and again. A notorious example was Sky Striker Mobilize Engage, which functions as a starter but also works as a bomb or an extender because it just draws you so so many resources. And striker players had access to three copies of this card, and it's not a hard one to either. So if you draw multiples of this, you are laughing because you're just getting so many resources for free, and your opponent just has to sit there and just deal with it. But also Dragon ends games because he attacks twice per turn and almost always does at least 6,000 damage. Uh, similarly, the Utopia Double Package allows you to summon a 10,000 attack uh, Utopia, which allows you to end the game almost there and then. And an old school example is Black Luster Soldier everywhere in the beginning, who is like a Boral Sword Dragon, but that's in your main deck, and that can attack for almost 6k directly. The final group we're going to look at, guys, here is Engine Requirements, aka the Garnets. And the reason why we call these the Garnets is because of the Brilliant Fusion engine and I think this is the most classic example of an engine requirement uh, engine. Brilliant Fusion was an amazing card because it allowed you to fusion summon a card like Gem like Seraphonite from your deck, uh, from using resources from your deck as opposed to hand or the field. Uh, when you would activate this card, you would have to send the fu fusion requirement cards from your deck to the graveyard. And why this works really well is because one, Gem like Seraphonite when it's on the field gives you an extra normal summon. Also, Gemlight Seraphonite requires a light monster to be used to fusion summon, so it allows you to send any light monster from your deck to the graveyard, which can set up some really good follow up plays. The downside with this is that you had to add, use a Gemlight monster as well, and the most common monster people used was Gemlight Garnet, which is why these cards are often called Garnets. Garnet doesn't do anything, it's 1900 attack, which is quite okay, but it honestly has no effect, it has no purpose other than just being a part of the engine and while it's worth having at one copy you really just don't want to draw this card at all because it is instantly a brick as soon as you see it. Another example of engine requirement cards are Exodia pieces. 
again, the Exodia pieces don't do anything. If you're building an Exodia deck, yeah, you've got to play them because that's the way you win. That's your win condition. But they don't do anything. They don't help you search other pieces out. And they're inherently just bricks from your main deck. A lot of character-based decks are also require you to play cards as uh, bricks as engine requirements. Such as Harpy Lady, Dark Magician, Blue Eyes, uh, Neos, Red Eyes, Blue Eyes, Galaxy Eyes. These cards don't really do a whole lot. But you have to play them in order to play the deck that you're trying to play. Similarly, uh, we have defensive options that also require bricks, such as Cyframe Gear Gamma. And uh, Cyframe Gear Gamma has to require, uh, in order to use it, you have to have Cyframe Driver to summon to the field because it's the main monster for the archetype. And so this inherently becomes a brick, particularly if you draw it, because then it's a resource you just don't have access to or can't use. Ideally speaking, when you're building your deck, it's okay to have a brick or two in your deck. But ideally, you want to keep this to a minimum. And so, ideally, I would say never try to have more than three engine requirement cards in your deck. Of course, if you play the Zodiac, you've got to have five. But never really want to have three in your deck. Um, try to avoid having as many of these as possible. Because they will basically cost you a resource if you open up your opening hand with them. Which could ideally be a star or extender. So guys, overall, that is the framework. Uh, we have our starters, extenders, removal, defense, finishes, and engine requirements. And like I said earlier, the amount of starters and extenders you have will determine what playstyle your deck is going to follow. And I've got three examples of playstyles which I want to show you. We have combo decks, control decks, or hybrid decks. Excuse me. <coughs> examples of combo decks are things like Lunar Light, for example. All 30 of these cards are extenders and starters for the deck. And um, most of the cards, defensive and removal cards, are in the extra deck. We do have a few in the main deck, only about 10 or so. But realistically, the deck is basically just a ton and a pile of extenders and um, starters. Pendulum or Endymions are very much the same, where 33 cards are dedicated to being extenders uh, in the main deck. And most of the removal or defensive cards are in the form of the extra deck or uh, the form of these cards here in the main deck. One more combo deck I'm going to show you is Galaxy Eyes. Um, again, a whole load of starters and extenders for about 33 in total. With our bombs, our finishers, our removal cards, our um, defensive cards all being in the extra deck. Except for these couple here, hand traps, which are in the main deck as well. Because these don't work as hand traps and these are unique enough to put in the main deck. Controls, for example, is very, very different. This is an example of True Draco. True Draco has an abysmally small amount of starters because it got nerfed recently. Thanks to Dragonic Diagram getting limited to one. The starters for this deck are only Diagram, three copies of Duality, Terraforming, and Card of the Mize, and that's it. Everything else functions as an extender for the deck. And uh, so this deck is inherently very slow. Because of that, we do not rely on the extra deck at all to provide us with any additional resources so that we can play a powerful floodgates like the Monarchs Erupt to kind of negate my opponent's board and say, yeah, nothing but tribute summon monsters can use their effects and therefore hopefully cripple our opponent enough so they can't play the game. The rest is just using powerful floodgates to kind of control the board. Control, another control deck is Subterra. Subterra, uh, does it, again, has very, very few amount of stars and extenders. 15 in total, uh, there being at the bottom here. And we don't really use the extra deck to provide resources other than making the dragon targets. So if your opponent uh, uh, destroys your back row too much, you can punish them by summoning out a really, really powerful monster that's going to kind of ruin their day for them. And the rest of the deck is mainly just removal cards and, uh, and uh, bombs and defensive cards. Last one we've got here is Altergeist. Altergeist are a bunch of spellcasters. Again, very few amount of stars and extenders uh, in the main deck. Uh, most of the rest of the main deck is form of control and removal cards and defensive cards. And then the extra deck is really just cards that are played in triplicate because you want to banish them for part of extravagance and then maybe have a chance to use them if the situation permits or allows to do so. 
Uh, in the middle of these two, we have our hybrid style cutter decks, and these are my personal favorite types of decks. Uh, so we got Sky Striker. This the, the Sky Striker engine is not a lot. We have uh, only 15 starts and extenders in the main deck. However, the extra deck has an obscene amount of starts and extenders. Uh, sorry, not starters, but extender cards. Uh, three copies of Hayate that send cards from your deck to the graveyard. Add cards from deck to hand with Shizuku, or get cards from graveyard to hand with Kakari. Then you've also got things like Hita and uh, Selene that work as stars as well. Uh, sorry, extenders, I keep saying stars. The rest is through removal cards and uh, searchable forms of removal and defensive cards. And yeah, that's Sky Strikers. Shadow, a fusion based deck, very similar, uh, only 14 or so starters. Um, extenders in the extra deck, such as Con Construct, uh, Cross Sheep. Uh, Predator Plant, Verte, and Aconda that get you more resources when you summon to the field or send them to the graveyard. And then you've got tons of defensive cards, uh, removal cards in your main deck. And the last one, of course, being my favorite archetype, Orcus. Um, only 24 starters or extenders in the main deck. Um, some You can extend it further and play a combo version of Orcus if you want to. I prefer hybrid. Um, you've got extenders in your extra deck like Lib, Scrap Myvern. And IP Masquerader, Galatea, and Dingirsu. And then you've got loads of removal cards to kind of comp compensate for the things that the Escher deck can't do overall. And so, guys, uh, that's really my run through of my advanced deck building guide. To kind of wrap it up and just explain it all again. When you are building a deck, you want to first look at what your starters are available to you that you can play in the deck reliably. Then you want to look at the high quality extenders that you can add to your deck. The number of starters and extenders that you have overall will determine your playstyle. A lot of starters and extenders will mean you're playing a combo style deck. A low amount of starters and extenders means you have to play a control style deck. Somewhere in the middle, hybrid style deck. When you are testing your deck, if you find it bricks too much, try adding more starters. Or try adding more extenders or changing the quality of the extenders. If you are looking at removal cards, removal cards, you want to have removal cards that are relevant to the meta game that you're playing against. It's no point playing things like things like um, uh, let's think of a removal card, Mystical Space Typhoon, if all your opponent's cards activate when they're destroyed by card effect. You want to add, use things like Cosmic Cyclone more, and this is where you're going to spend a lot of your time thinking what is relevant to the meta game that I'm playing against. Similarly, defensive cards, uh, things like Anti Spell Fragrance. I should have had that in earlier. Let me just quickly get uh, anti. Do I have anti in my deck? Yep. Things like anti spell fragrance absolutely destroys pendulum decks, but does nothing against something like a control deck like Orcus or Guru. So be careful when you uh, with what you choose for your defensive plays. Finishers, if you can afford to run a finisher in your deck, play finisher cards. They often help you to seal the game and just win quickly and almost can be surprised against your opponent. Uh, there aren't too many in the game. Uh, sometimes just out resourcing your opponent can be your finisher. But um, if you have access to them, definitely play them. And then engine requirements, you want to play as few of these as possible because they are bricks. Uh, if you have to run them, run them. But if not, try stay away with them. So guys, this has been my advanced deck building guide. Hopefully this has been useful to people. I want people to get better at the game and build better quality decks. And I want to, when I do deck profiles in the future, build them in this kind of format. And hopefully this makes sense to people. So thank you for tuning into this video. Hopefully this has been useful. If you have any feedback, leave me a comment down below or questions. And I'll be happy to answer it and get back to it soon. Uh, thank you guys for watching as always. I'll see you soon. Take care.